How you doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Chair Talk. Guys, today we're going to discuss inmate on inmate sexual assaults. Now, guys, if you're an officer and you're responding to a sexual assault or you get the allegation of a sexual assault, we're going to coach you, uh, kind of give you some of the steps that you need to take to make sure that we're doing everything correctly and also to help aid the other departments that will have to get involved, including the Special Investigation Division, uh, medical, mental health, prison management. I mean, guys, when a sexual assault happens or it's alleged, there's a lot of parties that are getting involved to make sure that we cross our T's, dot our I's, but more importantly, we protect the victim, the person making the allegation. Now, granted, guys, I know a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about could touch on Priya, but I just want to say that long before Priya came into the prison systems, because I was there before Priya as well, so was Joe, we've always done these things that we are going to talk about, at least on the tactical side, on the immediate side. This was pretty much common sense corrections 101. Now, unfortunately, with Priya, I get why it's needed. Don't get me wrong. I, if you want to put a policy like that on good intent, I get what you're trying to accomplish. But having said that, I want people to know that we have always stepped up and when someone had made those allegations or if we did witness a sexual assault, we took most of these measures already. Now, I know people will say, well, Priya was put together because we wanted to put a more trusted system so um, people have a, have a spot to utilize uh, in case they have been sexually assaulted. And as you can see, since Priya, uh, allegations have gone up. Yeah, but there's also a lot of people misusing the system as well. I want to get that out there as well. So again, it, it's... It's, I get why it's needed, but granted, we've already had these things done in the past. Uh, now we made it so specific, including not just what has to be done, but how it has to be done, that we let, left ourselves vulnerable to uh, the manipulation of the procedures uh, that ultimately lead us to what the ultimate outcome will be. Uh, but having said that, uh, Joe Papone is going to be my guest, and we're really going to break down what we feel will be step by step what you need to do. Uh, when you come across an inmate on inmate sexual assault or when you have an allegation of an inmate on inmate sexual assault. Now, guys, if you get your chance, please get your hands on this book, Inmate Manipulation Decoded. It's a good book. It uh, does very well. It's used for training all across the country. It fills the gap. I, I, I think that there wasn't a lot of training on inmate manipulation, at least based you know, on, on this type of level. So I'm, I'm, you know, love the fact that I wrote this book, love the fact that people are reading it, they're enjoying it. And again, it's being trusted to share out to training. So again, guys, if you want to get this book, link to this is in the description. It's on Amazon. We also have How to Succeed in Corrections, Lessons Learned While Working in the Prison. Guys, book's got this book's got tons of knowledge for me and other professionals in the, in the field of corrections, those that have walked the walk. I think this book will be used in training uh, eventually because we're working with the publisher now to get this released. Uh, to some trainings, uh, also colleges, because a lot of colleges are taking experience-based books. And this book, again, is published by Blue 360 Media. The link to that is also in the description. And I have a book that's going to partner very well with that, and that's coming out at the end of the month, but you can pre-order it now. Tips for new corrections officers and their supervisors. This book is due out by the end of the month, but again, the link to that is in the description. You can pre-order it now. It's from the same company, Blue 360 Media, and eventually we'll work on a deal maybe where, you know, if you get them in bulk, we could partner both the books up and maybe provide a discount. And I'm also working on a daily calendar with little tips and quotes, and that's going to take some time because I'm doing like stuff day by day, so I don't expect that to be out till next year. But it's just something to have in front of you just to start this off with the day and then, you know, just to kind of get our knowledge deep within the complexities of of corrections let me get joe on what's up joe hey what's going on anthony how are you bud good joe thanks for suggesting this idea i think it's a great idea it's something we've covered in the past but you know it, it, it's a good time for it to be re revisited and uh joe if I, if I may ask you uh you know um tell us a little bit about yourself <laughs> my name is joe pomponio i'm a retired lieutenant from the Texas department of corrections of 30 years i'm currently working in our local sheriff's department in the jail division and i'm also a panel member here for tear talk and we love having you joe now guys bear with us on this i want to let people know that when an inmate makes an allegation of sexual assault let's say from another inmate uh, this allegation is to be taken extremely serious. This is not 
a joke. Now, granted, uh, there have been inmates that have misused it, uh, but even if they misuse it, it's the boy that cries wolf. But in this case, we have to keep on being 100% uh, effective. We got to keep on responding, do what we have to do, uh, because you never know. You know, it, it's just you could have that one chance out of 100 where the person actually was raped. And we are responsible for so many things when it comes to either the allegation being made or if you actually witness the sexual assault. So the first thing I want to mention, and we're going to be talking from a custody perspective, so we're the ones that are going to respond. Uh, and then again, we're going to be setting the road for the other departments to come in, as I mentioned, the investigative division, medical, mental health, prison management, etc. is that we want to make sure that this whole time, throughout the whole process, we treat the victim and the situation with the highest level of integrity and professionalism. This is not a joking matter. So again, Joe, it, I, I mean, if you catch a sexual assault happening, obviously there's going to be an extreme tactical approach. There's going to be probably the use of force. So what we'll do to keep this simplistic is what we'll do is we'll go as if the allegation has been made. We'll do that because a lot of the steps that we would take to stop a sexual assault will fall into a use of force dialogue. And I kind of want to stay with the steps that are needed for us to move forward um, after the assault has happened. So we'll just kind of maybe focus on if the allegation is made. And I will say one thing uh, before we continue on this first tip is that most of the sexual assaults do happen in uh, third shift or overnight shifts, but it doesn't mean it can't happen on any other shift or any other location. Uh, sometimes they happen in blind spots where you're just not observant. I'm sure now with understaffed facilities, it could be happening a little bit more because a lot of areas may not be covered and, and inmates could take advantage of uh, those little blind spots. But definitely if you're working a unit and you have those cells that fit two inmates, that's usually the time where you better be vigilant and do your rounds because a lot of times at night, these are when these sexual assaults are happening. But Joe, let's go with this first tip. Treat the victim and the situation with the highest level of integrity and professionalism. So, so you're walking in, you're an officer, an inmate comes up to you and says, hey, can I talk to you privately? Now, you got to be wary of this, but having said that, you know, depending on what your procedure is to be able to get that inmate out of his cell, because that could change. Uh, shift to shift or whatever it is or the type of status they have. But let's just say you're able to make that happen and the inmate makes an allegation to you that they were just sexually assaulted. Are we going to make jokes about this? I mean, how, how are we going to treat this inmate? Yeah, I mean, uh, you're definitely going to treat the, the situation in the scenario with professionalism, uh, with confidentiality um, and and integrity. You know, in the event that an inmate does come to you um, and alleges that he has or she has been sexually assaulted, um, you know, the first thing is to, you know, make sure that that person has been, you know, separated, you know, in from from their alleged, you know, assailant. Um you know, because if they're coming to you, there's, there's, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to use the word trust, but there's, there's enough confidence there that they feel like they can divulge that information to you. And, you know, with this being an actual scenario, um, them coming to you is, is a big step because generally, generally inmates won't tell the staff, they'll find other ways of letting this, you know, information out either through letters, outbound letters, or maybe outbound telephone calls. Very seldom uh, will they, will you hear about it directly after the incident has happened. So make sure that we're treating um, the situation seriously. Um, we're bound by law to treat this matter seriously. We're bound by laws to, you know, take steps to protect the victim in this case. Um, you know, like I said, you want to make sure you, you instantly have separation. Um, generally, I would take them directly off the pod. I would not even allow them to go back to get their property. Uh, I would get them immediately out of the area. Yeah, and I want to mention something. Joe made a great point. Um, 
allegations could be made through many different systems. It could go through immediately through custody. Uh, it could go through civilians that come down. It can go through a family phone call, a call to a lawyer. It can go through the grievance system. Uh, they can call a crisis hotline because those numbers are toll free. They can call the OBUDS person. Uh, it could be released in a therapy sec uh, session. Uh, you know, so there's many ways. But as I said, once you find out that there's the allegation being made, all efforts have to be uh, to protect the integrity of the situation. And like Joe said, making sure that the victim and the aggressor are separated immediately. But I want to make pe people aware that when we do this separation, you got to maintain eyes on the victim and the aggressor, because we're going to start moving into that next phase eventually of possibly creating a crime scene and securing evidence. And guys, outside of the location of where it happened, don't forget when it comes to evidence, and we're going to get to that, um, the inmates themselves are evidence. And we'll get to what I mean by that as we get to that part. Uh, but real quick, so uh, just to compliment the first tip real quick, when it comes to treating victims in the situation with the highest level of integrity and professionalism, please, guys, when you're chatting, no talking. Uh, I'm sorry, no joking about what happened. Um you know, this person, if, they, if, if they've been raped, and again, guys, we're talking about uh, this actually occurred. We're not talking about people that have misused the system. We're going to go with the fact that this is what happened. Uh, the person is a rape victim. Now, regardless of what they've done, I know it, I get it, you know, but we have a professional job to do. So this person is a rape victim, and we have to treat them as such. So again, you, you take them away from the aggressor immediately, keep your eyes on them. Uh, you go ahead and make sure there's eyes on the uh, aggressor as well. You got to get your supervisor on the scene because now we're also going to start taking uh, detailed notes as well. You know, basically what time were you notified? Uh, you know, what were your actions? Who did you call? So this is where it all starts. So right off the bat, if you have a body worn camera, Guys, you put the body-worn cam camera on and you could tag it later as confidential. But you could put the body-worn camera on as you go ahead and uh, take the complaint from the person who's making the allegation. Now, granted, um, there should be this movement. Uh, you're going to have to wind up taking these inmates both to medical because uh, they both have to be evaluated. So you have a lot of couple of things. You have a couple of things going on at once. Uh, but while you're taking the inmates to medical, obviously you're going to keep them separate. So you're going to have two teams, you know, one escort for the victim and then let them go through what they got to go through. And then once they're cleared and the victim is placed, then you're going to have uh, the other person brought uh, to the infirmary. And again, I'm, I'm working with small infirmaries. If there's bigger infirmaries and you can manage the separation there, then you could do it that way. But you want to make sure that, you know, you are not, um, having them next to each other or crossing paths with each other. Would you agree with that, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. You want to keep them separate at all costs. Um, you know, the, the, the main priority at this point is to get your victim to medical as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I generally, the aggressors, once the victim has been secured in the infirmary, the aggressors, I like to put in, in a dry cell environment. Um, because of the fact that, you know, he's he's actually a walking crime scene, possible crime scene as well uh, with potential evidence. Um, but the needs of the victim are, are a little more prioritized than than the aggressor. Um, so you want to kind of keep them separated, you know, um, make sure your victim gets the medical. You know, I, what I would uh, suggest, um, honestly, is is when, if you're on a wing and this happens, you know, notify a supervisor immediately, obviously, but um, call for an escort officer, somebody who can come and escort the victim um, directly to medical. Um, this way you can kind of keep eyes and, and visual on, on the aggressor if he's still on the wing and, you know, also keep, you know, a visual on the cell because at some point you're going to have to secure the cell. Um, and you don't want anything tampered with, um, in, in the process. So, um, making sure that your victim is seen is, is, is kind of your number one priority at this point. Right. And then I want to mention something, because again, guys, there's a lot of things going on at this time. So all the tips they're there, we're putting them back and forth, but it's kind of just rolling into the other, 
uh, when when you get the inmates to medical after they get evaluated, um, obviously this is basically going to fall into the PRIA protocol for the facilities that follow PRIA. The person is going to be seen by medical and mental health. Now, for those that are escorting the aggressor, the person being accused, have your body cam on, but you're not asking them any questions because they got to be read their rights because this could go criminal. Now, if they want to volunteer stuff in your body cam, that's okay. You got the body cam on, collect all the information you can, but you are not to ask them questions when you are walking that ingress, uh, that aggressor, the person being accused, because you will wind up violating some level of due process, especially because the investigation or the investigative division will eventually have to come in and uh, you know, pretty much read them their rights before they even think about asking them any questions. Now, for the person making the allegation, uh, you know, again, you, you know, be open, listen to what they have to say. It's not a joke. Uh, get the details you need to be specific and do what needs to be done. But you, you don't have to push past a certain point because eventually uh, they could also meet with the investigative division or maybe they may find more comfort in talking to a counselor. Now, granted, uh, if the person may not tell you exactly who it is, that's okay. We'll figure all that out later, but let me get you to where you need to be. You know, we'll figure out the aggressor. We'll figure out all that later. But if you're saying you've been sexually assaulted, and you're not comfortable telling me by who, uh, then then uh, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll still run this through this whole process. And then we can figure it out later because maybe you'll feel more comfortable telling the investigative division or, or telling the medical or mental health. Also, as Joe mentioned, when you're bringing them over to medical and mental health and after they've been evaluated, uh, and again, we're kind of running it like a pre protocol technically because it's a sexual assault. Uh, they are. I love what Joe said. You're putting them in a dry cell, which means they're not going to have any clothing on. They're going to be in a blanket. They're not taking any showers or nothing. And you're going to secure the um, their clothing as evidence, both from the victim and from the aggressor. They will not be allowed to shower, as we talked about, because the evidence could still be on their body. So they're going into a dry cell with no ability to wash themselves at any level, if by chance you mess that ball up, especially if you mess it up with that aggressor and you put them in a regular cell and you let them shower and you will literally destroy all evidence and you will get torn apart from the highest of levels. Would you agree with that, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and, and on top of that as well, you know, when you're securing, securing evidence, you know, they're the, the cell that that inmate was living in is also considered a, a crime, a possible crime scene. So you want to make sure that that cell stays secured um, until you have the chance to get in there and, and collect, you know, bed sheets or, or, uh, you know, blankets or towels or anything else that, that could have any kind of uh, possibility of having DNA on it. Um, with that said, you don't want people being able to walk in and out of the cell because you're going to compromise that scene. So uh, make sure that, you know, anything that you take that you're tagging with an evidence card uh, showing a chain of evidence, because everything that we do from this point on matters and is and is integral because, you know, the tagging of the evidence, the way we have kept everybody separated, the way we're trying to preserve crime scenes, all that's going to be used later on down the line in the investigative process when internal affairs comes in or even further than that, if it goes to court. So everything that we do from this point on matters. So you wanna make sure that you have your evidence tagged, you got a chain of, chain of custody started. You wanna make sure that nothing, to you know, on the crime scene from the cell, the aggressor or the victim, nothing's been tampered with. And, you know, preserve everything that you possibly can. Now, I, I wanna mention something too here. I don't know how all facilities work. Uh, some facilities, the officers may be a bit more empowered to start doing what Joe has suggested. Uh, some facilities, they're not empowered to do that. So what's going to happen is you have to know that when this allegation was made, uh, it, you, you pretty much are going to be aware that, you know what, I'm pretty sure the investigative division is going to want this as a crime scene. So you secure the cell, set a logbook up or whatever it is, have an officer put that post to document who's going in and out of that because it is an actual crime scene. And the investigators will eventually come in and look for evidence that they believe is relevant, especially after they talk to both the victim and the aggressor. Uh, so, again, it's it's getting the inmates out, 
Some may uh, rely on the officers to collect the evidence. They may have that level of training, uh, but a lot of states really do leave it up to that investigative division. So once it's called out to the investigative division, they're going to declare for the crime scene to be put up. But granted, if I was on the floor, I know that's most likely going to happen. There's no harm or, or, or no foul if I just secure the cell uh, and just kind of make it safe until it's declared. So either way, as soon as I get the victim out from that area and then eventually get the aggressor, uh, again, this happened in, in a cell. We're kind of more focused on it being in one of those uh, two-man cells. I'll shut the cell door. Put a, As a sergeant, I'll put a cop in front of it. Uh, they'll be in charge of anybody coming in and out. I want it documented. But any approval to go into that outside of the investigative division usually will have to come from the shift commander on site who is really going to be making a phone call to the higher ups asking, can this person come in? Cause at this point it should only be those that are handling the investigation. That means if there's an administrator trying to go in there, not happening, exactly. they're not going in only the investigative division at that point, because you don't want to tamper with that evidence. That crime scene is the most important part of making sure that goes up to the highest level of prosecution. And I want to say one thing right now too, guys, a little sidebar, but it makes sense. Everything we're doing now matters because if this goes to a higher level, I want people seeing our competence. I want them seeing something perfect, you know, because we were on point because we handled what was expected of us because it, it really does matter how we're viewed and you don't want to drop the ball on this because that's just a bad reflection on us. You know, it's an extremely bad reflection on us. So, Joe, the importance of that crime scene ba being maintained and separating the victim and, and again, you know, the uh, securing the evidence, making sure that those those uh, the victim and the aggressor aren't taking a shower. You know, I mean, these are things that matter because it, it ultimately helps the case later on. Correct. Absolutely. You know, everything, everything from the point where, you know, we we separate the 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 victim from the aggressor from that point forward everything matters it's integral uh you know general rule of thumb is you know the least amount of people involved is the better um it, it keeps the it keeps you know all these people from being called to to testify um the least amount of people involved is is the best um, you know, and, and for the officers, I know for the rookie officers that are watching this, I know it's a lot to kind of take in, but uh, understand that, you know, by this point, your shift supervisor is going to be involved and, you know, he's going to be giving you guidance. You know, he may he may tell you to stand in front of the cell and, and hold security over the cell until, until internal affairs comes in and, and releases it. Um, you know, and it, when I when I discuss things. You know, I want to just kind of put it out there that in Texas, you know, we're not considered law enforcement. We're not peace officer certified. So a lot of this stuff kind of falls on us um, as the officers before uh, we notify internal affairs. So, you know, things differ from state to state. Um, so, again, you know, Anthony talks about, you know, how things are handled from from their side because of the fact that you know they are licensed peace officers down here we're not so if you hear two different versions you know kind of bear with it because the process is still the same we're still we still have a duty to separate the victim and the aggressor we still have a duty to preserve the crime scene we still have a duty you know to to collect the evidence and hold the the crime scene until internal affairs releases it but you know everything that we do after the point where we separate the the victim from the aggressor, it definitely matters, especially for the court case. Yeah, because you got the safety of the victim, you got the preservation. Now, guys, mind you, when you are notified, the clock starts at that moment. So if you're notified uh, in person, or if you're notified through a documented JPEG, and the moment you open it, there it is. I was sexually <laughs> assaulted, and you. Hold it, and I'll get to that later. No, you can't mess around with those. I mean, literally, the minute you open up that letter is the minute you got to get someone on scene to see what is going on. So uh, when we get to talking about the detailed reports, because we're going to talk about a couple of things, uh, and we'll, maybe we'll talk about that next. I have one more thing, actually, I want to mention. 
SI or the Internal Affairs Division, the person that's overseeing the investigation, uh, may require for the victim to go to see a sane nurse. Now, a sane nurse, uh, by definition, is sexual assault nurse examiner. They're the ones that will check to see if the victim was violated in any sense or form. And you need that sane exam. That sane exam, I believe, has to be done within 72 hours of that assault. That means that in some cases, the investigator uh, may call the prosecutor's office who will demand that. And then the prosecutor will say, I need that. And now we're getting that done. We are planning a trip and getting that inmate uh, out to a hospital or because not a lot of facilities have sane nurses. They could, if it is, there it is. But if not, you are taking that person out for a sane exam. And most likely it's going to be the investigators uh, that go along on that trip uh, to make sure, because now granted guys, that inmate, uh, the victim is evidence and we got to keep track of, of where that evidence is going. I'm not minimizing the victim by saying they're evidence, but guys, I, I, we need that evidence. We, if we speak cop talk right now, we know evidence is important that the due process, the chain of custody. So once that investigator, you know, makes that call to go to that same exam, they're going to be with that victim until all that evidence is collected so they could make sure that they could stand by and say this collection of evidence was not violated in any sense or form. W would that kind of work the same way with you guys with the prosecutor making the request? And Yeah, actually, Internal Affairs down here would make that request, um, you know, and, and major emphasis on the word sane exam nurse. They have to be SANE certified. These examinations cannot be done by just any emergency room nurse, any emergency, you know, you got doctors that aren't even SANE certified. You have to make sure that these are certified SANE uh, examiners because, you know, for all intents and purposes, you know, with that inmate being a walking evidence, um, you know, it, once the rape kit is completed, if it's completed by somebody who is not sane qualified, um, your case is pretty much dead in the water from that point. So, yeah. you know, if, if you happen to be the officer that does escort this person to the ER, um, you know, make doubly sure that whatever nurse is there, make sure they are sane qualified. If they are not, do not allow them to touch your offender in any way, shape, or form until you actually have somebody who is SANE certified there. I can't stress that enough. Um, I can't tell you how many cases we've seen lost because, you know, they take them to the ER and you're, you know, the local ER nurse does their thing and, and it's, it, it, it just turns into a, a nightmare. Now, guys, when you get your, uh, when you start to write your reports, obviously you're going to have your, the people on the tactical side on the front line that are going to write their reports, everything that they've done from when they've received the allegation. Uh, so you want the time, you want that noted to their instant reaction, what they did, uh, bringing the person to medical, separating them from the aggressor, uh, having them evaluated by medical and mental health. Maybe if the person needs to make a phone call to a crisis hotline, uh, we, we, we could allow that. I know that could be something that's done through PREA at least, but a lot of facilities do offer that. Um, but you want to detail everything. And then the supervisor on scene, or maybe it may be higher up, maybe the shift commander, you want to start working on a timeline. Uh, the timelines matter because this is going to be something that's going to be put into a packet. Remember, guys, everything here is evidence. So from the reports to the, uh, if you have body worn camera, the footage, you know, whatever you have is all going to be collected and tightened up into a big, nice little bow to hand over uh, to the investigation division who will wind up reviewing what they got to review and then handing it over to the prosecutor's office. Uh, hopefully, as again, if you guys have body cameras, you got those body cameras on, you want to collect that footage, you want to also tag it as, as a private because you are uh, taking the inmate over to medical as well as, uh, you know, you, you could be there when they're um, talking to the therapist, like right on the outside. But, you know, granted, it's a small world in corrections and, you know, you may be hearing certain things. But again, you got to be professional. But again, the reports matter. 
because the reports are basically the detailed reports because that kind of helps us out with liability wise. But on another note, and more for vanity, it's how people see us at the higher level. So we want those reports looking good. We want the supervisors on site that review those reports before they send it up to the shift commander to look really good. We want the shift commander to do what they got to do to make sure it looks really good uh, when it gets to prison management, who then gives everything over to the investigative division. You know, So you don't want to just bum rush these reports because these reports are a reflection of you and your professionalism. Uh, would you agree with that, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. You know, your your reports are a direct reflection as as to your abilities as a as a shift supervisor. Um, you know, timelines, uh, not just in this, you know, in, in this scenario, but timelines in general for any kind of major incident um, are uh, just key to being able to write a good report. Um, you know, if you can keep a good timeline you know, everything else kind of falls into place when you're putting your report together. So, you know, the the better the better your report, the better it is further on down the road, uh, especially when it comes to prosecution. Because, you know, you got to remember every report that you write at some point, you know, maybe maybe read during a trial or in the court. So, you know, uh, having a professional having a professional report um, definitely goes a long way. Yeah. And remember, guys, it's a narrative, you know, so, you know, we're talking about the specifics, who, what, when, where, uh, if you know how, we're just not going to translate the why. That's not on us. But remember, guys, you are not talking to the aggressor. The investigative authority will because they got to read the aggressor his rights. And you also, as I mentioned before, before we get to the next part, you don't want to overwhelm the victim either. If they give you enough information to begin the process, go ahead, begin the process. And then eventually when you get the other parties in, they could work their magic uh, to get more information that they need to start holding people accountable. I, I, I've seen it where it may sound sexually assaulted by who I'd rather tell the investigative division, but by who we need to know who stop the, you, you, let it run its course, and then they could figure it out. Granted, even if the inmate's playing a game, uh, sadly, we have to treat as if they're not playing a game. And technically, uh, if they don't feel comfortable telling us what happened or who did it, uh, then we can you say, hey, listen, I couldn't get this information, but you go give it to the investigative division. The investigative division, believe it or not, if the person says that they were sexually assaulted and they don't tell the investigative division like who sexually assaulted them, the investigative division is still going to do their research. They're going to still check cameras. They're going to still everything. They're going to do whatever they can uh, because all because the person doesn't say who sexually assaulted them doesn't mean it didn't happen. So the investigative division will try, but all because they don't say who did it doesn't mean that the investigative division says, well, if you're not going to tell us anybody, we're not going to help you. No, they're going to pull out cameras. They're going to try to get whatever evidence they can. And then if by chance they can't discover it, at least they've done their due diligence. And now it goes back to the person who's the victim and says, listen, if you're, we're trying to work with you and all these efforts are documented by the investigative division, by the way, we're trying to work with you. Uh, but we did, this is the things we did to try to figure out who sexually assaulted you at this point. We can't figure it out. We're going to need your assistance. So if you don't tell us who it is, we can't hold them accountable. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Joe? Would you agree with that? You're muted, Joe. You're muted, yep. baby. Yep, caught me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and another thing too to keep in mind, you know, since we're at the we're we're at the exam level here with the sane nurse, you know, most facilities have a victim's advocate um, assigned for that facility. Could be a chaplain, could be your chief of classification, um, it could be an administrator. Uh, make sure um, that we offer uh, a victim services to this offender, uh, you know, at some point, either during or after the exam, uh, give them the opportunity to talk to somebody. Um, like I said, your victim's advocate could be, it could be mental health, it could be a chaplain, it could be, you know, your chief classification, um, uh, administrator. I mean, it, it's just, it, it, it could be anybody that's, that's assigned to that position. But the main thing is, is we offer that victim's 
assistance to them. Um, it's in Texas. It's it's part of our standard operating procedure for our, you know, uh, our policy, which is kind of in conjunction with the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Um, that's another another big priority because you don't know what emotions that they're going through. You don't know how they're going to react when the shop wears off. Um, you know, you, you just want to make sure that you have somebody there that they can talk to um, in the event that it's not, you know, to the investigator, in the event that it's not to the supervisor or anybody else. Yeah. And, and by the way, because of Priya, we do have a monitoring system. That's something that uh, was uh, new, was brought to us from Priya. But basically, uh, once someone makes the allegation, uh, kind of starts day one of the monitoring system. And most facilities should have a Priya compliance manager. And what happens is, is they'll get an alert of this allegation. And then their job is to kind of check on the individual a certain amount of times in the course of, let's say, 90 days. Uh, not, not in an overwhelming way, but just to make sure they're coping okay, give them whatever resources they may need, which could be maybe a phone call to a mental uh, a crisis, a crisis line or whatever it is. Uh, but also uh, there's they can keep them updated with what's going on. You know, so basically as they go through the system, if there is a disposition, they'll meet with them and say, hey, this was the end result of your case. Uh, this is what we got going on. Also, the Priya compliance manager will make sure that stuff is put in place to keep them separate. So once you have an inmate that has made an allegation, uh, even if the allegation is fake, and this is where the manipulation comes into place because Priya inmates have used Priya to manipulate single housing uh, to get an officer off a unit, uh, or I just don't want to be around this one inmate. But once an allegation is made, whether it's true or false, it's probably in the best interest to separate uh, the individual, some some type of documentation. Now, if you have an inmate that does it like crazy, it becomes a bit more difficult because those are usually the inmates that don't want to be housed with anyone. So anytime you put them with a cellmate, yeah, he touched me, he touched me, he touched me, he touched me. Uh, and then you wind up going crazy putting in these keep separates because, you know, imagine if you uh, had a false allegation on you, you're not going to be too happy about that, you know? So you still do it to protect the inmate. But I will say this, I think at that point, the agency should also now, because you do want to protect the interest of the victim, but there's also um, a balance of if the inmates making a, if the victim's making a fraudulent complaint, you have the integrity of the person being accused as an aggressor. So having said that, there's a fine balance there. If the person is really weaponizing the system, uh, they should be held accountable. And I think the investigative division, once they find that it's fraudulent, and that basically the case is unfounded because there's evidence against it and there's just a pattern of it. They could refer it over to the prosecutor to see if there's some charge with messing with government um, fraudulent, fraudulent act. It would be basically called the fraudulent act, you know, which will be discovered through patterns. You may not get it the first time, but if it's a continued pattern and now the system is trying to work around it, uh, that's a problem. It's affecting operations. They should be held accountable for that. But with that said, if it is a real case, uh, the the compliance manager or the person that oversees the function will wind up getting alerts that they have to keep track of. So maybe a 15 day, uh, a 30 day, a 60 day, and maybe a 90 day. Just let me just check on this person. And then they're going to document whatever keeps separate. So we don't actually wind up housing these two individuals uh, together. Um, would you agree with any of that, Joe? What about the fraudulent claim real quick? A little sidebar, but what about the fraudulent claims? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, you, you have the manipulation factors and you're always going to have, you know, the, the fraudulent claims. Um, nevertheless, you're, we're still going to we're still going to treat it like it's the real thing and go and go through the process. Um, down here, we really don't have any kind of uh, avenue that we can utilize to, you know, when the victim is, is using this for manipulation factor because he doesn't like where he lives or, you know, um, we can, we can do, uh, some, and, it, and it, it's, it's a stretch sometimes, you know, for, for lying during official investigation. Um, it's hard, it's hard for us to get anything on that, um, when they're considered the victim. Um, as, as I retired in 21, we could not write any kind of disciplinary cases against the victim, even if they were lying. 
Um, but I think they were looking at changing the policy on that uh, because the manipulation factor has become become so so great now because now they see well hell I don't I don't like living with Ganges so I'm going to say he touched me right go live you know in a single cell you know and and they're finding out that that's you know those type of allegations are spiraling out of control right so the so the best way to do that is that when the investigative division is working on their investigation uh some pass up the results of the investigation to some higher level authority whether there's a compliance unit uh at that you know maybe at the higher level executive staff that review all the investigations or whether it's given back directly to the administrator and they look at what's in front of them and they could determine if the case is substantiated we did have a sexual assault unsubstantiated is not enough evidence to go either way or unfounded now granted if you're looking to push some type of fraudulent act it has to come out unfounded it has to come out that it was unfounded because there was evidence to the contrary uh, if you don't have that, uh, the unsubstantiated ones really won't carry weight because it's not enough evidence to prove, but there's nothing to disprove it either. So, uh, and I don't know who, who gives the results at the end of those investigations. Those are more internal, uh, but it could be done, as I said, uh, internal to the agency. It could be done uh, by the maybe the administrator or uh, maybe some high-level executive staff. However, they work that out, but you wouldn't push a fraudulent claim unless it's been proven that the uh, investigation itself was an unfounded result. You know, that basically there was evidence to the contrary. Now, um, I want to mention something else that most people tend to forget. Uh, this may be uh, because of Priya, but I, I, I think we, we pretty much kept track of this beforehand, but uh, you know, if I, if I got an inmate that is uh, found guilty of uh, sexually assaulting somebody, they should be brought back to mental health for what they call a risk assessment to see if we have an inmate who's a sexual predator. Because at one point they could be getting released and it's like, ah, you're not getting released today because of all these things you've been doing behind the wall, you're getting civilly committed. Because at this point, we can't trust you to go back out to society. And I don't want people to forget this one follow-up because this doesn't always happen. You know, because this could also happen with inmates that are just, um, you know, exposing themselves or masturbating. I mean, these are charges that are sexual in nature that once they're found guilty of these charges internally. So I'm talking about the internal system, you know, the disciplinary system within the prison and the jail. They should be sent back to mental health for risk assessments to kind of keep track of all this. And then one day they think it's all a game. Like here I am all day. I'm going to masturbate. And when staff walks around, I'm going to just masturbate in front of him. Or I got a cellmate. I'm just going to ma let him watch me masturbate. Well, guess what's going to happen, bud? You know, all these things are being documented. You're not just being charged. You're being sent over to mental health for risk assessments. And then the day you go to leave, all of a sudden you find out you're going to a, a commitment center because right now you're going to be treated uh, for your sexual compulsion. So please, guys, if you are uh, doing this, and you're, especially if you're in prison management uh, or if you're pre or handling the PREA compliance stuff, please keep track of the outcome of the institutional charge and make sure that they are being referred for that risk assessment. A lot of people don't do that. Um, any thoughts on that, Joe? Because we have one more follow-up I'd like to add yeah, you know, I, let me let me uh, you know, uh, there's two things I wanted to add in there. Uh, number one is that anybody who is tasked with with these overseeing the PREA program on their facility, make sure that you are keeping track of your um, predators and victims. Um, these are lists that we keep and we enter into a database statewide. Um, you know, in the event that these offenders are transferred to other units, um, they can look on the computer and, and, and see right off the bat that, you know, OK, this guy's he's a he's a sexual predator. Um, we need to, you know, make sure his housing is a little more restrictive or, you know, this person, you know, is a repeated victim. Um, if it's, you know, the real thing and, you know, that uh, unfortunately does happen in the prison world. Um, but, you know, 
we need to make sure that we're we're keeping a good accurate list of our victims and our aggressors um, because that can help you know other staff at other facilities later on down the line in the event that these um, these two are, are transferred. Um, the other thing I wanted to throw in there real quick was, um, you know, and even though we say there's no such thing as consensual sex in the prison, um, you know, we know that it happens. And if you happen to stumble upon that, um, make sure you're treating it as a potential rape as well. Um, because you just never know. Both inmates may say it was consensual, uh, but there's no such thing as consensual sex in prison. So make sure that we're treating those instances um, because he may be under some duress to say that. So make sure we still treat it as a possible rape scene. Yeah, and I want to mention something too, guys. If you do see someone uh, and, you know, again, there's no consensual sex, but it's still a PREA violation. But having said that, it may not go that far if you don't have... Um, someone claiming that they were sexually assaulted. But if you see someone that looks like they're getting raped, uh, don't jump in and break them up because uh, you may think they're getting raped, but they could be lovers too. Yep. And sometimes when you go to break apart a lover uh, or lovers, uh, they both will turn on you. Uh, so granted, I know some people may say, well, you should jump in there right away. Whoa, mm -hmm. uh, officers, officers have been badly hurt breaking up lovers. Uh, I want to kind of finish up a thought that Joe was saying, actually, because that's actually I already had as my last thought too, is that there are inmates that are vulnerable and there are inmates that are aggressors. You never want someone that's labeled as an aggressor with the vulnerable. So basically if you have a person that is a sexual predator, now they could come in with that type of status or they could develop that status when they're behind the wall. Uh, you don't want to house them with someone that would be considered vulnerable, like a transgender could be considered vulnerable or someone who's constantly being sexually assaulted. So usually uh, the people that are in charge of the housing will have what's in front of them, a list, and it will tell you where each person is if they're labeled. Uh, you know, the PREA will give us something that actually helps us uh, where it creates a label system. But again, I I know we were doing this way before. It's just now it's more, um, it's, it, I guess it's more of a digital system, but we knew our units back then. We knew who was who, but you know, now it's more towards the system gives you these alerts. So basically what happens here is that if I have a vulnerable, I could put them in with another vulnerable or I could put them with a neutral who's just someone that's really never been a vulnerable or an aggressor. Uh, but you never want to put a vulnerable with an aggressor. Now, with that said, you could also have a vulnerable who is it who is also an aggressor. You know, let's say, for example, we have a transgender who has sex crimes or who is an aggressor just in nature when they got into the facility. They will get housed with a neutral. You try not to put two aggressors together. Uh, but with that said, you want to protect that vulnerable. So at no point are you putting an aggressor and a vulnerable together? And if one person fits both criteria, they're aggressor and they're a vulnerable, you go ahead and you uh, put them with a neutral. And it sounds a lot uh, complicated, it is, but when you got a good experienced person that handles the moves, whether it's done through classification or a sergeant, however that system works, uh, it, it is very, very beneficial because it helps us alleviate any possible liability, especially when you have someone that has a documented history of sexual assaults and you slip and you wind up putting them next to someone who has a documented history of being, being assaulted. Um, you're just never going to be able to live that down. And I think the officers on the unit should be aware. Anybody that's in charge of making moves should be aware. And I also believe that people that oversee all this also do audits once in a while because it's, it's, I would like to say we have a perfect system, but we don't. But you could put fail safes in play. So remember, orders like this will come top down. So you want to make sure that anybody that's involved with that movement from, uh, you know, suggesting it all the way to the people that are going to be doing that placement, all kind of understand who they're dealing with. So it goes to all those levels and someone will just come up. Most likely the frontline officer will say, hey, guys, uh, these two just had an incident last week. Um, I, I don't know why we're housing them together. Uh, and, and it's just, cause remember guys, I mean, people may real quick, you, you're dealing with hundreds or thousands of inmates and people may look up and say, well, how could this happen? How can you put them both together? 
guys, there's so many incidents happen a day and, and it's just, it could get lost in the system because it's just so many inmates. So you have to have all these measures in place. But I do remember back in the day, our officers, or as Joe would call them, our bosses knew our units, knew our inmates. And I, I know it may sound funny, but it didn't slip up as much. But then when we start re relying on technology to do it, people start kind of saying, well, you know what? If that's what they want. And it's like, wow. So I get it. Technology helps. But I don't think we should get to the point where we're too relying on it. Because I think, you know, back in the day, we made the effort because we had to make the effort. But now we kind of step back because, ah, the technology will handle it. I think it's funny. I, I know we keep more track of it. But I, I think back in the day, we just made more effort to know those inmates and we kind of knew who was who and what was what. And now it's like, ah, you know what? Well, ah, the system didn't say it. Oh, then we must've missed it. And you blame the system. You know, it's, you know what I'm talking about, Joe. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we knew, we definitely knew our convicts back then. And, you know, we didn't rely on technology to classify inmates for us using a point system because of the fact that, you know, we got up close and personal with these convicts and, and knew their business. We knew their backgrounds. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a night and day difference as, as far as that goes. But, uh, you know, at, at, to echo what you said, yeah, we need to make sure that we do everything possible, not, you know, to make sure that we're not putting an aggressor with a vulnerable, um, you know, I don't know if our units are still doing it, but when I retired, you know, each pre coordinator had an outline, you know, a, a uh, uh, a board, a map a board. Of, yeah. yeah, a board. It had the map of the unit on there and with a color coded matrix. And we tracked all our vulnerables, we tracked our aggressors, um, and we also used it for STG purposes. So we can monitor, we can monitor physically, you know, every day, you know, what sections are hot, what sections are not. Uh, you know, it was it was a good added tool that 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 helped us on a daily basis. Yeah, and, and guys, at the end at the end of the day, you know, I I think we've gone through a lot of changes, and I, and as I said, I I just wish that when we implement policy, even based on good intent, and we talked about this the other day, you got to leave some of the management of the how things have to be done for staff. They got to be able to because because even though we believe it, believe it or not, as we discussed this process, we made it very simple. Because this is not as simple as it may be or as it happens in the moment, but we kind of just simplified it. So when you're dealing with this in the moment, it's good to have it in the back of your mind, but don't think it's going to be that fluid either. You know, uh, hiccups along the way. I mean, I was thinking even when we were discussing it, a lot of caveats and turns that it can go to. But I said, no, Gan, stay focused because uh, it, 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 with this stuff, it can go so many different ways. and You just got to be able to pick up the ball and run with it. Uh, but I want to kind of stay focused where you get you get the allegation, what is expected of you at, at least the most simplistic of levels that you cannot drop the ball on. And these are the things that we talked about that you cannot drop the ball on. Hey, Joe, you have anything you'd like to say in closing, sir? Yeah. Uh, you know, when it comes to, to allegations, let's make sure that we're we're treating everything as a potential assault. Um, and just remember that your actions and everything that you do from the point that you are made aware of an allegation, um, your actions and everything that you do could, could be, you know, potentially wind up in court and, and called, you know, um, as witness or, or, you know, looked at character wise. So professionalism and integrity is, uh, is, is, is the, one of the utmost important things to, uh, to keep in mind while you're conducting, you know, your duties, um, hopefully this will kind of help you guys understand the process a little more. Um, like I said, you know, you're not, you're not looking to take on the whole process yourself. At some point you'll have supervisors there that will, you know, kind of help you and, and guide you through the process and let you know what you need to be doing, what you, what you can't be doing. So, um, you know, the, the main thing for the frontline rookie officers is to, Make sure that we get the victim and the aggressor separated, and then we notify supervision immediately. Yeah, and, and it's funny because as I'm thinking in my head now, you know, things that we used to do automatic, I, I'm picturing myself saying, "Oh, I didn't get the alert on that." Like, like you know, I just, I just, I can't get that off my mind. I think what we could do, maybe with Russ in the near future, uh, depending on how the day goes, we'll, we'll maybe catch up with Russ tomorrow. Maybe we could talk about the 
how it could be, how even just maybe pre itself could be misused. Uh, what are the gains? Uh, and then we could cross into those other areas that fall into Priya, which would be voyeurism, harassment, and um, and sexual assault. Uh, the ones being most used are usually harassment and voyeurism. Uh, harassment is just, you know, unless you have the body cameras on, or if it's hard to prove what was said, you know. And then the voyeurism is a tough one because voyeurism is uh, actually has... Um, it's, it, it has a high level of uh, severity to it because they, a lot of people believe if it is a true voyeuristic individual, uh, that could lead to a sexual assault. So right. the voyeurism could be the first step towards a sexual assault. So voyeurism uh, is treated at the highest level of uh, effectiveness because, again, people could say, hey, um, this person's watching me and the next thing you know, the person gets assaulted and... It's like, hey, he's been reporting that, but it's also misused a lot because, I mean, let's be honest, uh, especially with staff I'm talking about, our, our job is to observe them. And when the inmates don't want to be observed, they will say that I'm staring at them or, you know, someone's staring at them or whatnot, or they were watching me take a shower. Um, you know, they, they uh, maybe the physical side, or when they pat frisked me, they touched me on my inner thigh for three seconds too long. And, and, and we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about what we feel could be done to counter those allegations because at the end of the day, you can't find yourself. Um, I don't want to use the word entertaining them, but you got to be weary of, especially of the, as the investigative division or someone in charge of the PRIA compliance. This is where PRIA, um, it, it, it should have really talked to staff more before all these things were implemented. But having said that, this is where it matters because at the end of the day is a lot of the stuff that the inmates are making these allegations against are really within our routine duties. You know, the, the, the pat frisk. Yes, we are allowed to touch inmates professionally to see if they have weapons on them. And yes, there will be time when a male officer uh, may observe inmates in the shower, the male, male inmates in the shower areas, you know, mm -hmm. but now uh, inmates may say, well, shoot, I, you know, maybe I have something on me or, you know, I'm doing something in the shower area. So let me get this guy off my back by saying, yo, I'm going to write a letter to administration saying that, uh, this guy's watching us in the shower too long. And I think the investigative division, uh, what they do is, I'm not saying they don't look at, if there's video footage, they're going to look at the pat search or they're going to look at the person doing their rounds and what they're going to come back is it's not a PREA violation. It's in the course of their duties. Okay. You know, uh, sometimes what happens here is, you know, you get an allegation like, uh, yeah, they're watching me in the shower and the officer's doing the tour and someone comes back and says, well, how long does it take them to tour the showers? Why does that matter? You know, they, they tore it until they feel it's toured. Now, uh, you know, that's their job. So some people kind of cater into that complaint. But the problem is you got to be very wary of that because that's going to become the inmates um, initiative to keep on trying it and keep on trying it. And 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 real. And we'll talk about this more maybe on next time. But the scary thing about this all is when that complaint is made, uh, it could wind up moving the staff member who is uh, being accused. So now if you have a staff member that's doing their job and they're being effective, it takes the momentum right away. So what you got to do is, okay, if I'm going to move Joe because his inmate's making this allegation, I know they're playing games, put Ganji in because it'll be just as effective. Then the inmate makes the complaint against Ganji. You know, and then all of a sudden Ganji got, makes another complaint. And at one point it's like, okay, these are fraudulent complaints. There's a pattern here. Uh, now we got to work with the investigative division to see if we can find some uh, evidence that's leaning towards the other way. And I will tell you one thing, all you need is 51%. Yep. That's all you need. If you can get the 51%, which could fall into the pattern, because there's a pattern there, you're telling me that the last six officers that work this unit have done all these things to you. You know, at one point, the pattern of the person making the false allegations start to lose credibility. So yep. again, if we're not keeping track of that, uh, and we'll, I think we'll talk about that. I think that'll be a good discussion for next time. As always, guys, the show is tipped up. If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. Stay safe.